Before I saw her with him, I believed that I understood pain. The lady I cherished, my life that I created, broken in a single instant. Not only had I been duped, I vanished from existence. My world warped into an unrecognizable shape, a nightmare I was unable to escape. The chuckles that used to fill our house haunts me now, resonating in the voids, the place where love once resided. Every kiss and every touch was a lie. And now anger is the only thing left. Never again will I be the same, nor will she in addition, while I was putting the birthday card in the mail. It occurred to me for a moment that a whole year had passed. More than the cool September air, that realization made my spine tingle. Well, life carries on. I walked the half mile to work every day, murmuring to myself. I made sure my new condo would be close enough to walk to my office when I was looking for one. In this manner, I could get rid of my car, save money on insurance, and still have my motorcycle in case I ever needed to travel. Within a mile of my new residence were stores, eateries, and all the other amenities I could ask for. It was dark outside at six in the morning, because there was not much traffic I didn't mind. Usually, it took me less than 15 minutes to get to work. I made myself a cup of freshly brewed coffee and went to my office. How come I have 18 emails this morning already? As I browsed through them, I wondered. I was waiting for two pieces of information, but the rest were trivial and jokes. It took me until roughly 710 to respond to the remaining ones after printing those out. Next, I looked over yesterday's sales, making sure to look at what was produced during the later shifts and any problems that might have arisen during the night. The other workers were starting to show up at a little after eight in the evening. I worked as the purchasing manager for a Minneapolis-based manufacturing company. A third of the 175 employees are under my supervision, and I also oversee the office. I had worked here for six years, and after these past eight months, my diligence was starting to pay off. You would succeed if you worked as many hours as I did. Two, unless you weren't really trying. I was undoubtedly giving it my all. I would typically arrive between 6 and 6.30 in the morning and stay until at least 7.30 at night. Weekends were different, but I usually worked eight hours more. I became really committed to my work, but at this point it was all I had. As the month was coming to an end today, I wanted to make sure everything went as planned. In addition to reminding everyone to complete their shop orders by the end of the day, I verified my inventory numbers and scheduled the delivery of two truckloads of materials for Monday. While completing a last inventory check, my boss, Ken, stopped by my office on his way out. Why are you still in this place? He said, I'm the only one you have to impress and I'm leaving. Ken, I'm just checking my production and inventory figures before corporate closes the books early tomorrow. In response, I said, Steve, you always have strong month-end results and great numbers. Just shut down the computer and leave for home. Ken gave me some encouragement. Yes, I will. I just need to get one more thing done before I head out. All right. Furthermore, I sincerely hope to not see you here tomorrow. No one can be in here for a day after Saturday morning when the pest control crew is coming to treat the office. Ken told me to go home, unwind, and enjoy his weekend. When I did eventually walk out, it was well after 8 o'clock. I saw people having a good time in the bars, eating at restaurants, and meandering through the bustling streets on my way home. As usual, I just shook my head and went back to my apartment by myself. Before moving in, I fully renovated the second-floor apartment, which had two bedrooms and two bathrooms. I had a big balcony at the back that overlooked a park with a lake, and I had comfortable heating. The lake was surrounded by a three-mile walking and bicycling trail. Sunday mornings are my favorite time to get up early and swim a few laps before breakfast. I didn't check the number of messages on my answering machine when I noticed it flashing as I opened my door and threw my keys on the counter. I pressed the delete key. I went to the refrigerator, got my favorite wine out of the open bottle, removed the cork, and got a nice glass from the cabinet. A few months prior, I had begun using them after wondering one evening, what am I saving these for? With a glass of wine in hand, they shouldn't just sit and gather dust. They were beautiful. I opened my laptop and turned on the TV. I noticed that I had six new emails. Two of them were about things I had bid on on eBay. Three came from my parents, two from my one and only friend, Nick, and one offered a job that could be done from home. As I made my way to the kitchen, I thought, I'll check them tomorrow. Shortly after moving in, I had renovated the kitchen. 
With its massive gas stove, double oven, large stainless steel refrigerator, two sinks, and gorgeous countertops, it looked like something out of a magazine. Everywhere you looked was the dining room and balcony. I was having problems falling asleep recently. I could not get my mind to stop racing while I lay in bed. I discovered that being extremely tired was the only way to get a good night's sleep. Thus, I had created a home gym out of the second bedroom. I worked very hard every night between 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock. I'd have one last glass of wine, take a quick cold shower, and head to bed after that. Every day, that was my routine. I had dropped from a softer 195 pounds to 175 pounds over the course of the previous year. Despite my small size, I had strength. Dinner was just like every other night of the week. Every night at 8 o'clock, when I got home, I didn't feel like cooking. I thus discovered a nearby eatery that would cook five meals a week for me and freeze them. Rice and steak with peppers was the meal for tonight. It needed only a few minutes in the microwave to be ready to eat. I filled a glass with wine again for myself, turned on the news while in the living room. Good stories just didn't seem to exist anymore. Unsettling incidents, tragedies, and celebrity-related scandals were consistently featured in the news. It was consistently the same. Not much better was the local news. It seemed like reality TV took over. A lot of these shows seemed dumb, and the few that were engaging ran on for weeks at a time. Truth. They are unaware of the true nature of reality. When I eventually turned it off and went to my exercise room, I told myself this. I ran on the treadmill for 20 minutes, which warmed my legs and quickened my heart rate. I stretched for 15 minutes after that before beginning my main workout. Most people could only train with the heavy bag for 30 to 45 minutes at a time. I concentrated on every motion, giving every blow my all. I grew up training in a Chinese martial art at a tiny school a short distance from my house. I loved watching action movies as a kid, and always thought it would be great to do what I saw. I assured my dad that I would persevere after he asked me to do so for months. I enrolled myself in a local dojo, but it was nothing like what I had seen in the movies. Our school was run by a strict instructor. Unless you wanted to experience his disappointment, you never questioned his orders. He pushed us so hard that we were hardly able to move. I was ready to give up after about two months. I made a one-year payment. And you intend to complete? Dad told me straight out. Do you tend to give up easily? He inquired. It's difficult. Take care of it. Finish the year and it's okay if you decide to stop after that. However, I want you to put everything into it. I want to see you try, not give up. Are you following? Yes, I answered, sir. I then gave it everything I had. That's how Nick and I met. He attended the same school as me and was a year older. He was about 40 pounds heavier than me even then, but his motivation was different. I'm in this class because my dad wants to help me develop my character and confidence. I don't really want to be here, but I have to, Nick once said to me. We grew close friends. In addition to hanging out and having fun, we trained as a team. Nick would often comment that I kicked too hard when we would assist one another with our training. Please calm down a little. It's not necessary to kick so forcefully all the time. With a slightly concerned tone, Nick said, however, I was concentrated. I was really looking forward to being able to spar in class, which would be allowed in just two months. I made a complete mess of my first sparring session. I was shocked to learn that I had lost to at least three other students. I had to train for an additional three months before I was able to win my first match. After that, I continued to advance. Before deciding to stop, I trained for an additional four years. Before deciding to leave, Nick trained for two years. I obtained my second black belt degree. Then again, I developed new interests. I knew what I wanted to do, even though my sensei wanted me to stay. We had a nice ending when he told me I could always return. I visited occasionally for a while, but I stopped a year later. Up until a few months ago, that is. Observing my watch, I realized that it was almost 11 o'clock. Sweat pouring down my face, I walked slowly to the bathroom. I threw my exercise clothes in the hamper after changing out of them and headed to the shower. After washing my hands and wiping away the perspiration, I allowed the cold water to rehydrate me for a short while. I saw that my beard was ten days old and that my hair was trimmed short. I completed my shower by applying shampoo, conditioner, and brushing my teeth.
I looked in the mirror after wiping myself dry with a warm towel and assessing my reflection. I was aware that I was still alive, but I questioned whether or not I was truly happy. I quickly emailed Nick on Saturday morning. Please come have breakfast with me on Sunday at 8 o'clock unless Lisa has convinced you to sell your bike. The mom and pops on 321 if you can still wake up that early. You are familiar with the location. My bike was my favorite. I'd owned and driven a lot of cheap sports cars over the previous five years, but nothing compares to riding a Harley. I really needed the freedom of being on the road by myself with my bike, the sound of the engine, and the wind in my face right now. A few months ago, I gave up wearing my helmet and started wearing sunglasses and occasionally a cap instead. When I left on Saturday at around 9.30, it was still a little chilly. There was only one other biker that nodded at me during this season. I continued riding until the first snowfall, but most weekend riders had already put their bikes away. It was a cold Saturday morning, and I knew the dealership wouldn't be crowded when I went in for an oil change. Simply changing the oil, I informed the technician. Will you hold off? He inquired. I'll wait, that is, unless you want to drive me home. For what length of time will it take? I'll get you back on the road in an hour, he answered. I looked for a bike on the showroom floor browsing the new and used bikes since I had some time to kill. A friendly-looking salesman came up to me and asked, Nope, getting my ultra serviced right now. Please ask me any questions if you have any. As he turned to face his co-workers close to the offices, he spoke. A few moments later, I noticed one bike. I got up on it and straightened it out. This ride is really interesting. Admiring the bright green custom chopper, I mused to myself, I had considered purchasing a helicopter at one point, but due to some previous problems, I had traded in my Road King for the Ultra. Isn't it a beauty? Coming up behind me, the salesperson said, with just 2,200 miles on it, the 2008 engine is in it. The frame was made by hand, and most of the parts are custom. Is it something you would be interested in trying? He inquired. I answered, I don't think I can afford something like this. The owner would be open to a cash trade or is searching for a cash sale. What are you currently riding? An Ultra Black 08, I stated. Oh, is there anything on it? Nope. I own it completely. I responded to my curiosity about the green chopper growing. All of a sudden, I was riding the green bike down the road. It was easy to manage and felt fluid. Twenty minutes or so later, I went back to the dealership. How do you feel? The salesperson inquired. Although I would prefer less trembling in the seat, it rides smoothly. I expressed my interest in speaking with the owner. After taking another look, he offered, to which I said, Yeah, let's get him on the phone. What makes you selling it? He responded to my initial query by saying, My partner isn't comfortable on the back seat and I want to keep things easy between us. I said, I get it. Does it have any saddlebags? If you need them, I have a small windshield and leather bags. He answered. We talked outside the dealership after the owner and his partner had brought the accessories 30 minutes earlier. I rode off on his bike while he and his partner took mine after we talked for about 45 minutes and made the purchase. It's a win-win situation for us both, as they say. In order to smooth out the bumps on my ride, I scheduled a meeting with the dealer for next week to have the seat replaced and to add a new shock. Call me tactful, but my back was starting to hurt after traveling for almost 100 miles. Nick was drinking his coffee by the window when I got there. He was at my side before I'd even cranked the engine. When was this lovely acquired? He inquired. Only a day ago. For it, I exchanged my Ultra and some cash. How do you feel? Whoa, is there anything not to like? He looked it all over and replied. He looked at it, asked questions, and declared his interest in something similar for the next 20 minutes. If I brought this home, Lisa would be furious, Nick remarked, continuing to investigate. She wouldn't agree to it, even though she doesn't ride with me very often anymore. But you have to give me a chance to test it out before you head out. I am owed so much by you. As we entered, he said, I told everyone the whole tale of how I traded in my Ultra for this new bike after we placed our breakfast order. We took our seats and caught up on each other's lives. I told Nick that things were still going great for me, even though the economy was causing a 15% drop in business. We were able to draw in two distributors from a rival company last month, which should help us close the year strongly. 
Nick said that nearly 10% of the employees at his company had been let go and that everyone was putting in a lot of effort to keep the company afloat. This year. I never imagined that having a job at all would make me feel fortunate. But that's the current situation. Nick said, I advise the guys on the floor to concentrate on their work and be grateful for their jobs because there aren't many out there. I inquired about Lisa's status at the hospital and whether her work felt secure. Human care is a never-ending need, and hospitals require skilled nurses. The only issue is that she occasionally has to fill in for people who are absent. She was too tired to drive home, so I had to pick her up early in the morning. To make ends meet, all we can do is our best. You know, Carol and Lisa are still good friends, and we get to see her occasionally. Nick spoke slowly. I said, let's not talk about that, and held up my hand. I just figured you might be interested. She keeps inquiring about you. If it were anyone else, he retorted, I would be out of here right now. I spoke fast. I just figured you should be aware. I'd heard that a few weeks ago you had a small altercation at the dojo. Nick chuckled. I've heard that the teacher advised you to take a break until you were able to focus more effectively. It was not a major issue. His new fighter made some remarks while I was practicing with the children. I just wanted you to know that following his victory, he was feeling a little too confident in himself. I told him that I had heard him refer to you as weak and suggest that you should practice with the younger children. Nick laughed. Kenny said that you took him out of the ring in under five minutes, forcing the sensei to intervene. You know how narratives can become jumbled? I answered. I made a fast move and then a second one. That must have irritated him a little because he became overly combative. I had to tell him to guard himself because he left himself vulnerable. However, I might have been a bit too strict. I'd heard that I might have given him some trouble. Hopefully he'll exercise more caution the next time, I said, grinning a little. Don't include me in the practice if you want to work with someone else. That's over with me, Nick answered back. You never take a half-hearted approach, do you? He continued, anticipating my response. After another hour of conversation, Nick said he had to leave. Tonight I'm going to Lisa's parents for dinner. Would you like to attend? Nothing is wrong with it. Lisa is eager to see you as well. We haven't all been together for nearly six months. Not today, I answered. I have some work that needs to be finished by Monday morning. However, I appreciate the invitation. Perhaps the next time, I responded. You can't stay away from people forever, buddy. Nick gave me a friendly shove before I went for a ride on my new bike. Ten minutes or so later, a beaming Nick came back to the parking lot. He said, I have to get one of these, as he got off his bike. It's much faster than mine, that's the only thing. On it, I wouldn't want to make a sudden turn at high speed. Taking off his helmet, he said, Nick was reminded by me to exercise caution and not take any chances. I got on my green bike and rode for a while while he rode home. I made a stop at a small diner on my way back into town at around 630. Though not particularly hungry, I did want a small snack before breakfast. I looked out the window at my bike and ordered a soda, some onion rings, and a burger. Every person passing by looked twice at least. Then three girls pulled up next to my bike, looked it over for about five minutes, and one of them took a seat. That didn't sit well with me. What if I got into your car and opened it? I approached them and asked. One on the bike asked if it was mine as the other two, startled, leaped back and almost ran into me. It is, in fact, my bike. Have you not been taught to respect other people's property? I inquired. I had no idea that my father and mother would have tried to take it already. Her reply came back without missing a beat. How is the ride quality? Furthermore, how is a person supposed to fit into that tiny back seat? She inquired. It rides well, and since no one sits in the back seat anyway, I really don't care about it, I answered, a little agitated. So please get off my bike if it's okay. Really? Do you believe that my weight will damage your lovely bike? She fired back. Now even if you ask politely... I wouldn't go for a ride. As she entered the diner, she said, Everybody is unique. Returning to my table, I muttered to myself. The three girls behind the counter occasionally glanced in my direction. I guess they're talking about me. The slender brunette approached me as I was finishing my food, thinking that I had already put on my jacket and was paying. She said, I've made the decision to give you another chance. I don't usually do this, but given that you live here, it seems like you could use a friend. I would appreciate a ride home from you to make up for what happened earlier. 
she said, walking outside. Let me just grab my jacket from the car and we can go. Had I not been taken aback, I could have declined. Nevertheless, we were riding my bike into town five minutes later. She held on tighter the faster I moved. She provided me with directions to her place once we arrived in town. She said, That was fun, but if you want me to ride with you again, you might want to do something about that seat. It's a little uncomfortable and too small. She handed me a piece of paper and said, Here's my number. If you'd like to repeat this, give me a call, but don't forget to adjust that seat. She spoke as she ascended the steps without turning around. She turned around just before she entered. Just so you know, my name is Pam. As she walked out the door, she said, as I slipped her number into my shirt pocket, I thought it was interesting, but also quite direct. The end of the month went more smoothly than I had anticipated, and the company was thrilled when I was able to negotiate 5% price reductions with two vendors. If you continue, we might still receive a bonus this year, Ken informed me. I also put your name down for Bill's company car since he's leaving. It's yours if you need it, but you can leave it in the garage. I thanked Ken and said I could see how it would come in handy when the snow started to fall on the weekends. I enjoyed my morning walks to work for the time being. My new bike's dealer replaced the seat with a more comfortable one and installed a new rear shock. The bike was nearly as good as my previous Road King. Are there any extra seats available for my bike? I inquired. What are you trying to find? In response, he said something cozier than mine. I informed him that my seat has fast release bolts and is good. He said you could carry it in your bag and wear it as needed. It was expensive, but then everything bearing the Harley Davidson name is. Pam gave me a piece of paper, which I kept for about a week. I'm not sure whether to call. In the past year, I had only gone on three dates. One involved a dinner with a female client for work. Normally, marketing handled that, but in this case, it was unavoidable. Though we didn't have a lot in common, the other two dates were enjoyable. I didn't enjoy going on blind dates. Hi there, Pam. I got going. It's Steve here. I hoped she would recall me. Steve? Steve who? She inquired. I'll offer you a hint. Chopper in green. She seemed to have forgotten about me, I told her. Why didn't you call me sooner? She answered. I needed to fix a few things on my bike because work has been busy. I stated, this Saturday, there's a ride. Do you want to go with me? Have you switched seats yet? Pam queried. To put it mildly, the new seat ought to be more comfortable, I answered. Then the answer is indeed. When are you going to come get me? She inquired. Roughly 930. Remember to wear warm clothing. It might be in the low 50s, according to the forecast. Do you own boots and a leather jacket? Don't worry about me, I asked. Just make sure you arrive on time. Remember where I live, please, says she. What's the number of your apartment? I know the address, I asked, not too quickly. She said firmly, I'll just meet you out front at 930 and we can go from there. After that, I had trouble striking up conversations and wasn't feeling well. Thankfully, she said she would see me on Saturday as she concluded the call. I had the impression of a teenager making their first date request. I felt so nervous that I was ashamed of myself. I grabbed a pair of gloves and put on my warm mid-calf boots and leather jacket on Saturday. I stopped after riding for about a quarter of a mile to put on my hat. It was quite cold. It took the engine's heat around ten minutes to finally start warming me up. As I stopped at a light, I thought, thank God for the windshield. It provided me with comfortable wind blocking. The first thing Pam said to me was, you're late. I looked at my watch and replied, it's only 935, it's always late. She said. Now let's see what kind of seat you have for me. I walked over to my bike and installed the new seat. I told her to get on and started the engine. The dealership was 20 minutes away and I could feel Pam leaning back and supporting me. Pam said, wow, that's cold, getting off the bike. She rubbed her face and continued, my cheeks are frozen. We went inside to get some coffee and warm up. As the others in the group started to show up, I said, throwing her a face mask, here. I explained that this would shield your face from the wind and keep you warmer. With a frown, she said, it has a skull on it. With a hint of annoyance, I responded, it's for warmth, not looks. Eventually, she said, thank you. Thank you so much for that. The ride lasted for approximately two hours, beginning at 10 o'clock. Riding alone, for the most part, were about 30 bikes. It was very cold and not many people wanted to ride. It was almost noon when we arrived back at the dealership. 
They had some cold snacks to offer, but I declined. Are you up for going to lunch? I inquired. Yes, but I can find something hot somewhere, Pam answered. We made a stop at Denny's. We located a booth at the rear, and the server brought us a steaming hot cup of coffee. Pam looked at the menu and warmed her hands with the cup. Are you getting warmer? I inquired. She said, I'm taking little sips now. It was enjoyable, chilly, but entertaining, she informed me. Do you frequently engage in this? I replied, not as much as I used to. Every year for the rally, I used to ride to Sturgis, but it has been almost three years since I last visited. Perhaps this summer. I've seen images. Do they actually have that many bikes? She inquired. They are dispersed throughout. It's a major occasion that spans nearly two weeks. I used to ride there nonstop with my friend Nick and spend three days camping. But now I'm used to being more comfortable. I'm overeating cold food and sleeping on the ground, I stated. However, I do enjoy taking lengthy rides occasionally. My mind is cleared and I feel liberated. When you are not riding, what do you do for a living? She inquired. I said, I work as a purchasing manager for a local manufacturing company. How about you? I reposed my question. In addition to working freelance, I teach art, Pam answered. Though the money isn't great, at least I get to enjoy what I do, unlike most individuals I know. Do you currently have a partner? I inquired. What piques your interest? She laughed at my response and joked. I was in a relationship once, but it ended. Since then, there have been a few dates here and there, nothing major. What say you? She inquired. Approximately the same. My relationship with someone special also didn't work out. If that's what you're asking, I haven't gone on many dates in the past year. In a sense, you're starting over. That's excellent. She smiled and said, It's nice. In this manner, she continued, I won't have to worry that you're just going through the motions. Why do you think I'm looking for something more than lunch? I answered, I believe you're open to new experiences with a ride like that. She chuckled. After discussing the fundamentals, let's see what more we can discuss over the next few weekends. I got quite close to Pam. I ran, and we both enjoyed the same kinds of food. She went rollerblading. I told her that her favorite band wasn't really my style and that she thought my workout room was a little too much. We agreed that it was acceptable to have disparate tastes. Would you like to spend Saturday night at a club? On Thursday? She inquired. I want my friends to meet you because a few of them are going. I felt awkward and said, I'm not much of a dancer. Not to worry. She smiled and said, just have fun. I did warn you after all, I answered. Pam said, I want to be comfortable. So she took the wheel on Saturday. My car is being taken by us. Despite the packed club, we managed to find a good table close to the dance floor. I had previously been here, and I didn't have a pleasant experience. We were enjoying ourselves, and Pam's friends were very welcoming when someone arrived that I really hoped not to see. He grinned and said, Hello there. Do you recall me? It appears you have a new friend. Did you lose the other one? Perhaps more than just a nice guy is needed for this one, he went on, drawing nearer. Dan here, Pam. Trying not to lose my cool, I said. He has only caused problems. His friends attempted to yank him away, but I couldn't resist making a comment as he turned to go. I've heard you and your pals like to put on a tough front. Dan turned to face me and threw our table and the drinks that were on it over. In a flash, the bouncers arrived and escorted Dan, his buddies, and me from the club. Pam remains indoors. You don't want to be involved in this, I told her. As they led me out, I said, I'll call you later. We walked around to the side of the building and all three of them started pushing me. Do you find me frightening? I made fun of Dan. You need your friends to support you. Dan swung at me, but I was able to deflect his blows with a quick jab of my own. It was a bad idea for him to charge at me. He gasped for air as I sidestepped him and swiftly brought him down. His friends tried to intervene, but I stood my ground and made sure they couldn't get to me. I was grabbed from behind by one of them, but I was able to free myself and knock him down as well. The third individual had already taken off. Dan was lying on the ground when I approached him and said, Don't bother me again. I turned to leave and noticed Pam appeared shocked. You should stay there, I said. I said, taking her arm gently and escorting her back to the club's front. We ought to leave before the police show up. As I led her down the sidewalk, I added, Come on, Pam, we really must go. We quickly made our way to the garage where her car was parked. I helped her into the passenger seat and opened the door for her. I got in and went to my condo by driving out onto the street.
It was a quiet ride. Pam merely gazed at me. What the heck was that about, Steve? She started to ask, but as I pulled into my building, I cut her off. Not this evening. Not now, but later. Let's talk later, I said, gesturing for the discussion to stop. Are you comfortable operating a vehicle? I'm doing fine. That's all there is to it. Please. But not this evening. Trying to remain composed, I said, I'll give you a call. As I exited the vehicle and entered my building, I added, before going in, I turned to make sure she was okay. I threw my keys on the counter, locked the door, and shut it. Despite my overwhelming and frustrated feelings, I knew I had to calm down. Around 6 a.m. the following morning, I woke up. I was leaning against the wall next to my treadmill while seated on the floor in my exercise room. I was still in my clothes from the previous evening. My clothes are wet from work. Despite my foggy memory from the previous day, I was aware of my hands. They needed attention. They were swollen and red. I couldn't recall much from the previous few hours, just that I was thinking darker than usual. My hands feeling icy cold brought me back to earth. I alternated between warm and cold every 20 minutes for the next few hours in an attempt to minimize the swelling and restore blood flow. I felt relief as I opened and closed my hands several times. There was only minor hurt, nothing broken, but I knew I wouldn't be doing anything particularly strenuous for a while. I am aware that I used some of the ointment previously. I said, eventually locating an old tube after rummaging through the bathroom cabinet and drawers. Not much remains. Perhaps I ought to get some more. Gazing down at my hands, I thought. Thankfully, Sunday is here. If no one comes, I can relax all day. The fact that it took them nearly two weeks to locate me surprised me. Not that I was hiding, but I also wasn't trying to find them. When I opened the door, the officer, Steve Moore, asked. I said, yes, my name is Steve Moore. We require your presence at the station so you can make a statement, says the second officer. How could I put it? No, I'll be heading out in a moment as I grab my jacket. As I stepped back inside, I said, we conversed back and forth for almost two hours at the station. I clarified that there had been a misunderstanding once we left the club and that I was just attempting to defend myself. I advised them to speak with the individuals seated at our table as well as the club personnel if they were interested in hearing from witnesses. At last, they informed me that everyone present agreed with my account. What then is the issue? I inquired. The issue? The cop spoke, seeming irritated. You took part in something that was preventable. See, I was afraid for my life. How could I be sure they had nothing dangerous on them? All I wanted to do was get the situation resolved and get out of there. Steve, I clarified, don't offer reasons why. What caused it to get worse? He applied pressure. You couldn't comprehend that unless you were present. I have to go home now, unless you're going to charge me. I have an early meeting tomorrow and it's getting late, I said to Nick. Thank you for coming to get me as we were leaving the police station. Steve, no issues. I've been hearing that you were part of something a few weeks ago. Taking a moment to look at me, he said, I don't want to talk about it at this time. All right, Steve. I simply consider everything that has transpired. Perhaps you ought to have a conversation. I don't have any problems. So shall we proceed? I spoke up a little bit. All right, all right. Nick sounded concerned and said, I'm just worried about you. I understand, but let's move on. It has been a lengthy evening. Fine. Just please don't abandon me once more. As he dropped me off at my condo, Nick said, like all the others, there were three more messages from Pam on my computer, which I erased, but she never seemed to stop trying. She called roughly five times a week for the first three weeks. After that, it fell to three, then to two, and at last to one. Every week. Every Friday, she would always call. It's me. The beginning of every message was Pam again. I would like to know if we can just talk or have dinner tomorrow since it's the weekend. Give me a call. Oh, and I will no longer be calling you on Fridays as of next month. I will arrive at your door. I just wanted to let you know, and that's it. Good luck with your evening. This individual is very resolute. Saying that, I erased her message. Is she really serious about this? I resumed my daily schedule of working from home, eating, and exercising. That was it. My life had returned. I declined Nick's invitations to watch games or eat dinner on a few occasions when he called. Nick and Lisa hosted Thanksgiving dinner for me. I sent them a list of things we wouldn't talk about via email. I wanted to be sure, but they knew it well. 
Dinner felt tense as usual, that unspoken problem lingering in the air that nobody wanted to bring up. I thanked them, and that evening, despite their offer, I went home by taxi. Pam sent me a short message the following day. I suppose I'll be at your door next week as I haven't heard from you. I will bring a pillow so you can sit comfortably. I'll see you on Friday. She declined. I told myself that no one is that tenacious. I realized the more I gave it some thought that I would really enjoy seeing her again. She was a wonderful person, and we got along well. I simply didn't want to talk about my history. And I was aware that Pam would not give up easily. I was getting impatient by Thursday as the week was going slowly. Friday I was totally preoccupied. I observed the clock while seated at my desk. Huge plans for tonight. Ken inquired at about four o'clock as he was walking by my office. She must be a unique individual if she can confuse you in this way. He made a joke. Leave this place now. Nothing is getting done by you. I'll see you Monday morning. Have a good evening, he continued after adding. I made the decision to end the day at 430. I said goodbye to Ken with a wave before making my way to the garage to get my work car. Usually, on the weekends when I anticipated bad weather, I would take it. I became aware that I was driving a little too quickly as I got home. Relax. I told myself that she might not even show up tonight. My heart pounding, I reduced my speed and drove cautiously. Thank goodness I was able to find parking close to my building. She had not arrived yet. I sat in the car for the next hour and a half, studying the entrance and going over some papers I had brought. I used my phone to make a few calls and felt cold all over. However, she never showed up. I quietly said, forget it, as I closed my file and exited the vehicle. She's merely teasing me. As I cautiously crossed the street, I thought to myself, after checking my mailbox, I ascended the stairs to my condominium. Pam was sitting on a pillow near my door. Are you this late all the time? It makes sense that you have no plans. As she stood up, she said, had it not been for my amiable neighbor, I would still be standing outside. Will you not allow me to enter? She appeared to be holding a soft pillow when she asked. As I opened the door and we entered, I couldn't help but smile. Are you drinking any coffee? It's been a while since I was waiting outside, she said, heading toward my kitchen while setting her jacket and pillow on a chair. Give me a moment, I said, untying my tie and hanging up my coat. Decaf or regular, I inquired. As long as it's hot, I don't mind. She rubbed her arms in response. All right, I'll wait, stated Pam, hands resting on her hips. What are you waiting for? As I was making the coffee, I inquired. She raised her voice a little and apologized for not picking up my calls and leaving me with a lot of unanswered questions. The guy I was seeing piqued the interest of my friends. He could be funny one minute and then mischievous the next. Two guys ended up in the hospital as a result. Not everything happened precisely like that. I told her that it was easier for them to get out of it than it could have been. Simpler. Stretcher to the hospital, they went. It could have been much worse, according to Pam, I answered coolly. It appears that you have some issues to resolve, Pam said, giving me a serious look. We can discuss that over supper. What's in your possession? Is that positive? She inquired. I thought you were going to feed me. All right, all right. You understood me. In what kind of mood are you? I inquired. Anything but chicken, please. I can't eat poultry because of a documentary I watched about the industry since that time. What about some steak with peppers, seafood, alfredo, or stir-fried beef? I recommended taking a peek at the food that's kept in my freezer. Did you create all of these by yourself? She inquired. I hope. I get them from Tony's across the street frozen. I have six meals every Monday night, which I simply reheat in the microwave when I get home late from work. However, your kitchen is really beautiful. You're not much of a cook she asked. I said, there are times, especially on the weekends, when I have the time and am not alone. All right, let's get started on the frozen meals now, and we can discuss breakfast later. She advised going to refill her cup after finishing her coffee. Pam selected the stir-fry while I went with the Alfredo. It was a small amount of wine, but it was one that she enjoyed. Hey, I buy the drinks I like to drink. If I give something new a try and enjoy it, I'll buy a few bottles to stock up on. I clarified that we didn't talk about serious subjects during the majority of our dinner. At last, Pam inquired, when are you going to tell me your story so I can better understand you? 
it's very easy. At the University of Minnesota, I got to know Carol. She was working in hospital management while I was studying business. We were introduced at a party by my friend Lisa's wife, and two years later, we were married. Together, we experienced four and a half amazing years. Then it came to an end. I told her that was all there was to it. Setting her fork down, she said, I got more details from a flyer. This is my tale. I was a baby when my mom moved out. My grandparents and I shared a childhood until their deaths. I returned to live with my dad and his girlfriend when I was 13 and stayed there until I turned 18. In my second year, I was awarded a full scholarship to the Minneapolis School of Art. There was legal trouble for my dad. He is currently incarcerated. I rented a room and worked very hard to support myself for the next 25 years. I painted portraits, waited tables, and even posed for art lessons. It wasn't always easy, but I managed to get by. She said that teaching art at a Catholic high school was my first real job, and that's how I met Rob. I thought I had found my true love and didn't want to lose him, so we had a brief engagement. He was, in my opinion, the nicest man alive. He was always there for me and took me everywhere. However, I discovered too late that he had a lot of control. I hope I'm not making you feel drowsy, Pam inquired while searching for dessert. Although I'm not a big fan of sweets, Tony gave me some brownies with last week's meals. I said, making my way back to the freezer to retrieve a tiny parcel. Are there any ice creams on you? I apologize. I don't, I informed her. Remind me to go shopping with you the next time. It appears that you have no idea what people enjoy eating. As she put the brownies in the microwave, she spoke. With Pam on the couch and me in the chair, we took up residence in the living room. Where was I now? Yes, indeed, Rob. He eventually began recommending people to me for friendship. I didn't like his friends, and he didn't like most of mine. Then, to our surprise, I discovered I was pregnant. At that point, one of us was constantly sleeping in the other room, and we were fighting practically every night. I had assumed the baby would help us get closer, but it has only caused more complications. Rob got upset one evening when I returned home later than normal. He expressed misgivings about the baby and accused me of being unfaithful. You stayed with him, but why? If you were that unhappy, I asked, why not simply depart? I had not given up hope that we could pull it off. You don't just walk away, she retorted. You attempt to fix things when they become difficult. Nevertheless, I was upset and Rob was intoxicated that evening. I figured I'd let him sleep and spend the evening with a friend. Someone shoved me as soon as I stepped out the door. The following morning, I was still in the hospital. They informed me that the baby was lost. Rob said he was trying to hurt the baby because he didn't think it was his when the police took him into custody. To make sure he stayed away from me, I pressed charges. He was convicted, and my divorce happened quickly. That being said, Steve, you are not alone in having a difficult past. With tears in her eyes, she spoke. We spent a few minutes sitting in silence. After we had both finished our drinks, we weren't sure what to do. Pam got up to say, well, I need to freshen up before bed. Having forgotten to pack extra clothes, I'll have to borrow some. So, grinning, get ready, she said. Tomorrow, I'll let you share your story. As she carried the glasses to the kitchen sink, she added, After guiding Pam to the restroom, I promised to fetch her a toothbrush from the adjacent restroom. Do you require anything else at all? Mouthwash? Dental floss? Deodorant? I inquired. Did you not come prepared? That seems suitable for tonight. She smiled and said, Next time I can bring my things. I finished getting everything ready for the evening and set it out on the counter while Pam showered. After that, we had a pleasant evening together, chatting and exchanging life stories. As we enjoyed each other's company, we thought back on the challenges we had encountered together. With a warm smile, Pam ran a gentle hand through her hair. She said, that was really nice. But let's make this evening extra special, she continued. Just recline and unwind, she said as she got up. Pam moved confidently and made the place feel comfortable, something I hadn't experienced in a long time. I was relieved to have her around and appreciated how effortlessly she made me feel comfortable. We had a shared experience that went beyond a brief meeting. It had to do with trust and understanding. We then had some peaceful time together, content with the relationship we had built. Pam cracked a light joke to break the ice. For someone who hasn't experienced this for a long time, you're doing fantastically. We both chuckled. 
experiencing the burden of the past. Remove the lift. We stayed lighthearted and shared stories for the remainder of the evening. We decided it was time for a nap as the evening drew to a close. Even as we drifted off to sleep, the warmth of our relationship persisted. Pam awoke the following morning to the light streaming into the room. Upon noticing my absence, she discovered a note on my pillow. Ran the entire length of the lake. When you wake up, just look out the balcony doors and give me a wave if I'm not back. Pam grinned, pulled a blanket over her head, and headed for the balcony. She called out to me as she saw me running by. Hi there, return quickly. With a wave, I headed back towards the building. Pam asked me a lighthearted question as soon as I got back. Isn't the weather cold? Not if you continue to move. I grinned as I said, I get energy from running in the morning. Together we had a leisurely breakfast with Pam starting her day with coffee. We laughed and joked, establishing a cozy and light atmosphere. The leisurely pace of the morning indicated that our relationship was deepening. We could both feel it, and we were prepared to face whatever lay ahead as a team. So how about we have breakfast, and then talk for a while after, Pam recommended. Would you like to spend the day with me after breakfast? I answered. So let's do both. She smiled as she continued. While making breakfast, I considered how I could answer her questions without coming across as overly open. That was exactly right on the money. Pam rubbed her stomach and remarked, I guess I was hungrier than I realized. Is coffee still available? Enough for you? I answered. I'm done with it. As I was putting the dishes in the dishwasher, I said, Would you like to begin our conversation in the living room or here? I think the living room is better, but you might change the topic, knowing you. Now let's get started and we can move to the living room afterwards. I would like the entire tale. Don't hold back. We have the entire weekend to ourselves. Curling up on the couch, she said, All right, what information do you seek? Leaning against the counter, I questioned, How long have you felt this way about particular things, first of all? Pam made a query. It's not a very strong feeling, in my opinion. That nightclub incident was inevitable. I answered, I'm truly perplexed now. Simply describe what transpired to me in your own words. Pam took a seat and offered encouragement. All right, you prevail. Sitting across from her, I said, Lisa and her friends threw a party where Carol and I first met. Neither she nor I were searching for anything significant. Nick was engaged to Lisa, and they were organizing a spring wedding. Nick wanted me to be his best man, and Carol was going to be one of Lisa's bridesmaids. Carol was therefore usually present whenever Nick and Lisa were. Although we initially hung out together, we soon started spending more time alone. After a while, we began dating. Carol was a gregarious person, and I frequently had to help her get out of tight situations. She had a knack of drawing interest from the wrong people when she didn't need it. I eventually grew weary of it and realized I needed a vacation. What's not right? One day, after roughly two weeks, she asked me, Are you no longer fond of me? Carol, it's just the two of us if we're together. I'm sick of you treating every guy you meet with such amiability, I informed her. Do you mean that you want us to be the only ones? That's probably what I'm getting at. I surprised even myself by admitting, Okay, let's give it a shot and see how it turns out. We were a couple at Nick and Lisa's wedding from that point on. Carol said it would be more laid back after we were married. Our nuptials? Surprised, I asked. Indeed. Our union. I'll eventually say yes when you ask. It won't be formal, though. It'll be more of an enjoyable get-together. And that was the start of it. We got married two years after we first met and moved into a lovely apartment near our jobs. Life was pleasant. Both of us had reliable jobs with extra cash to spare for fun. But things began to change in our third year. Carol said to Steve one evening, Have you ever had a really wanted thing you never tried? Similar to what? I answered. She said, You know something you've always dreamed of doing but haven't. Everyone possesses those. Intrigued, I said, Steve, I would like to do something special for my birthday, which is in two weeks. Could we do this for my birthday, do you think? She inquired. I'm game if it's something we both enjoy, I answered. On her birthday two weeks later, we made the decision to try something different. She had been considering it for some time, and we thought it would be an interesting opportunity to explore a new area of our relationship. Our goal for the evening was to get closer and feel meaningful connections with each other. Our goal was to better understand one another's needs and figure out how to help one another. But as time passed, 
We saw that our relationship wasn't getting any stronger as a result of this novel experience. Rather, it began to put some space between us. What we believed would unite us is actually tearing us apart. Carol gave signs that she wanted to stop as the evening wore on. I assisted her in cleaning up the mess in the room and made sure everything was in its proper place. She smiled at me and said, I feel pretty good inside, but I'm really tired. I have to get dressed. I tidied the space while she finished up. I got her a bottle of water after that, and she said she had to go to bed early the next day. She slept until almost noon in the end. Later, Pam seemed interested in hearing about last night and asked me about it. I responded in a straightforward manner. We went to the city center after I got her a new wardrobe. We enjoyed spending time together while eating dinner at a lovely restaurant. I finally came to the conclusion that this wasn't how I wanted our relationship to develop. Carol wanted to try something different the following year, but things didn't work out. I felt uneasy because we ended up in a packed club where she was the center of attention. I got to meet Dan and his friend Tim that evening, and they seemed excited to hang out with her. The longer the evening went on, the more frustrated I became. Carol was having fun with the attention, but I felt uncomfortable. I told her it was time to go when I finally had enough. I was upset about the night's events and kept quiet the whole way home. Carol said, It was just some fun, as we walked into our apartment, attempting to ignore what had transpired. Enjoyable. I was extremely ashamed. Still agitated, I replied, It seems as though I no longer truly know you. After days of tension, we finally got into an argument over dinner. Just a different experience, Steve. We remained together and nobody was harmed. Why does this matter so much? With obvious frustration, Carol said, Carol, do you know what I would like for my birthday in 2019? Something more straightforward, something that only the two of us can enjoy together, I informed her. Carol attempted to downplay it, but I came to the conclusion that our opinions on these matters were simply too dissimilar. After gathering my belongings, I made the decision to end our relationship. I will give you a call at my new address as soon as I have one, I told her. For me, this seemed to be the best option. I said to myself as I turned to leave, ignoring Carol's voice in my rear, that won't change anything. Nick took a seat beside me at the Holiday Inn bar. He laughed and said, you always do this, placing an order for a beer. Want me to let everyone know that I located you? Not at this moment. As I finished my third drink, I said, we view loyalty quite differently, I recently discovered. My marriage is beginning to worry me. She's really upset here at our place, don't you think? Nick stated that her only grievance is that I refuse to give in to her demands. Nick, she was making jokes about me while dancing with two guys. Trying to talk Carol out of it, I nearly lost my temper and confronted one of them. The most unfortunate aspect is that Carol believes she did nothing improper. As I took my fourth drink, I remarked, it appears that will not occur once more. Nick laughed a little nervously, but he stopped as soon as he saw my look. Apologies. Joking aside, we both know you won't actually leave her, don't we? Not at this moment, but I can't guarantee anything if it occurs again, I answered. I returned home after waiting a few days. We reconciled, and until my birthday rolled around the following year, everything felt normal again. This year, are you up for something special? Carol inquired, attempting to lighten the mood. For us, I had something a little different planned, a massage for two people. Though it was meant to be soothing, it brought to light the ways in which we saw certain aspects of our relationship differently. I came to the conclusion that we ought to talk about where we stood. We discussed our feelings and the events of the massage after it was over. We both agreed that it was a wake-up call and that we needed to improve our mutual understanding. I chose to follow the current. Since we're here, I'm curious where our conversation might go. What if we simply savor this moment? I recommended. Yes, let's go slowly. She laughed in response. The following morning at breakfast, Carol gave me a kind smile. See, I told you we could enjoy ourselves and still feel good when we woke up. Grasping my hand, she said, In retrospect, I realized that I ought to have taken care of the problem right away. I made that error. Carol thought I was cool with everything that had happened, but I played it down and said it was time to put these little games behind us. I went to the refrigerator for a glass of orange juice after we had been talking for a while, and I then sat down next to Pam. 
Pam said that things got a bit out of hand. Occasionally, we make decisions in the heat of the moment that we wouldn't normally make. It simply comes with being human. She continued, Your story has left me feeling as though we both need a vacation, she went on, reaching over for a bear hug. We made the decision to relax and enjoy each other's company for the remainder of the day. Later, Pam said, we went out to a nearby Italian restaurant for dinner and I held a glass of water. It sounds as though not everything went wrong. At least there were happy moments in your marriage, indeed. However, later on, things do change. After supper, I'll tell you the rest. Let's just enjoy the food for the moment. As our food arrived, I answered. It was a chilly walk back to my place with the wind howling and snowflakes soaring. I kept telling my story, thinking that the chill in the air would help me control my emotions. I tried to talk Carol out of whatever she had planned as her birthday drew near, but she insisted it would be a memorable evening. It was Friday, her birthday, and I still didn't know what she was going to do. All she would say to me was that I should just go with the flow. Dinner was finished and everything cleaned up by seven o'clock. She took me upstairs to our bedroom and struck up a conversation. This appears to be pleasant. As she asked me to calm down, I thought to myself, I agreed since I thought it would be a good evening, but I became nervous as soon as I heard the front doorbell. Who might that be? I questioned, a little uneasy. I stopped telling my story when Pam and I arrived at my condo, which annoyed her a little. You were just about to reach the best part, Steve, and damn it, she expressed dissatisfaction. I asked her inside if she had any needs. No, I'm all right. Just get comfortable on the couch and finish your story, she said. I should get a drink first. I told her as I took a seat across from her and opened two beers. This night is something I've never told anyone about, and it could make me unhappy. If you choose not to proceed, it is not necessary for you to. Pam gave me comfort. No, I should get this off my chest now, and the only person I feel comfortable sharing it with is you. All I can hope is that it doesn't turn you off. I'm not leaving, so it can't be that bad, Pam answered. Fine, in case you're prepared, I informed her. As I lay there, though, I heard voices. I should have probably stopped then, but I was too interested. I heard them close the door of the spare bedroom after walking down the hall. I started calling Carol's name after waiting for 10 or 15 minutes, getting louder until I yelled, Carol! After about 15 seconds, my life changed. Grinning, Dan entered my room and covered my mouth with tape. He said, this should keep you quiet, and left the dresser with the handcuff key. You're welcome to join us if you can get these, if not. He laughed and closed the door, saying, oh, well. I fought against the bindings, imagining what might be going on outside. I battled until I was too exhausted to continue. Dan eventually returned to the room, gave me another joke, and walked out. I struggled to get out of bed until the bed gave way with a loud crash. Everything was quiet after they left, save for the sound of the shower running. I lay there exhausted and angry. How long I stayed there is unknown to me. Carol screamed, and I heard it too. God, oh God. My hands and feet ached as she removed the headboard and untied me, but I was barely conscious of it. Carol looked really shook when I just saw her. Frustrated, I lost control and began hurling objects around the room. I was in the middle of creating a shambles when something startled me. I dismissed it, but I kept feeling it afterwards. At last, I collapsed to the ground and went unconscious. I awoke to find myself in a windowless room with a nurse by my side when I tried to get up. I discovered I was strapped to the bed. I'm not sure where I am. You're in Memorial Hospital, I inquired. Last night, you were brought in late. What state are you in? I'm tired and my hands hurt, she replied. I responded. You might have scars and lost some skin, but you'll be all right. She gave me comfort. Soon, the physician will arrive. Before heading out, she added, the physician showed up shortly after. You certainly look better than you did last night. What state are you in? He studied my chart and asked. I said, I'm hungry, tired, and sore. He took off my tie, gave me some painkillers, and applied an ointment to my wounds. Some of your scars will lighten over time, but they won't totally vanish. You can leave because the police said there are no charges. You were brought in, though, clothesless. That's all right. I'm going to call a friend. Nick brought me an outfit change. What took place the night before? Nick inquired. Carol arrived at our house inconsolable. She mentioned that something went horribly wrong. How did your hands get lost? Nick, pay close attention to what I say because I only want to say it once. Never again bring up last night, and please, please don't tell me Carol's name.
Are you following? Steve, I said firmly. He began, but I got in the way. You won't see me again if you do. Please just take me home now. Put an end to the conversation, I told him, attempting to control my rage. For the remainder of the drive, we were silent. I wasn't prepared to talk, even though I knew Nick had a lot of questions. After saying my goodbyes and entering my building without a key, I thanked him. I visited the apartment of the manager. Could you please let me into my apartment, Mr. Kelly? I inquired. He unlocked the door as we made our way upstairs. The place was disorganized with clothes and furniture all over the place. Steve, I would let you stay if it were up to me. However, it's not. You must relocate as soon as possible for me. I'm not going to discard you. However, you have 90 days. Please let me know if you need anything else after keeping the key. He said, I really apologize, and turned to go. If I'm not sorry, then what am I? I pondered in my mind. I guess I spent that night sleeping in my clothes on the couch. Next morning, I took a look around. The harm was severe. The bedroom had a lot of damaged furniture, and many of the chairs appeared to be broken. The apartment was littered with Carol's clothes. The kitchen was the only spotlessly clean room. I toasted some bread and poured myself some coffee. After ten minutes, my phone rang. Just before everything in my bedroom quieted down again, I discovered it beneath a pile of items. I discovered I had not returned Carol's three calls. I switched it off and unplugged every phone as I went through each room. The kitchen phone, which had the answering machine turned on, was the only one I kept connected. Just as I was sipping my second cup of coffee, the phone in the kitchen rang. I gave it to the answering machine. You can hear me and I know you're there, Steve. Carol's voice was audible. It wasn't meant to be how it happened. Give me a call so we can speak. I'm afraid to return home in light of everything. Kindly give a call. You are important to me. I cleaned up as best I could because I really needed a shower. I got ready, wrote a list of things I needed to buy, and left. I went to Walgreens first to get my prescription filled and supplies for my wrists and ankles. For later, I also purchased three boxes of lawn bags. After that, I made a new account with a private number and went to the mall to cancel my Sprint account. We have checking and savings accounts, but my bank was closed for the weekend when I wanted to take money out. Still, I made a stop at the ATM and withdrew the whole amount from both accounts. Before leaving for home, I made one last trip to the store and purchased three six-packs of drinks. I saw two messages from Carol and one from Lisa when I returned. I read Lisa's messages and deleted Carol's. This is Lisa, Steve. I have to visit Carol and pick up a few things. She's upset, but I'm not sure what happened between you two. I'll be there about seven o'clock, unless I hear from you first. Please give Carol a call when you have a moment. She is quite concerned about you. I had a lot to do and only about two hours left before Lisa arrived, as I saw by looking at my watch. Carol's closet appeared to be full of clothes that I had taken out the previous evening. There were clothes all over the bedroom and hallway, and the closet rod was broken. I took a plastic bag and began gathering objects. I started in the living room and worked my way up to the master bedroom via the hallway. Ten bags later, I stopped to have a drink. How could she have crammed so many clothes into such a tiny closet? I pondered. I had twelve bags in the end. Three for her dresser and bathroom stuff, four more for her shoes. I was ready for Lisa to come over after having two more beers. What does all of this mean? As Lisa and Nick entered my apartment, they inquired. Everything that Carol owned, excluding her furniture. I responded. I was only interested in a few outfits, not all of them. Lisa brought it to my attention. Carol isn't moving with me when I move, per the apartment manager's request that I look for another place. They are all her belongings then. I'll get rid of any leftover furniture or she's welcome to come get it. I explained her choice. Lisa said, don't you think you two should talk about this? Not a possibility. I'm going to down the final three beers from my six-pack if that's okay. Tonight, I need to get some sleep, unless Carol chooses to wreak further havoc. They packed what they could into their SUV and drove off, saying they could tell I wasn't in the mood to talk. I hauled the mattress out, flipped it over, and lay down. The following morning at nine, I woke up with some aches. After downing two painkillers and a beer, I promptly went back to sleep. I spent the entire weekend doing that. I requested a week off from work over the phone with my boss. Although he wasn't happy about the short notice, he agreed to give me the time off after I told him about my accident. My messy marriage was, I suppose, a good excuse. 
I resumed organizing things on Monday. We had checking and savings accounts, so I took half of the money and opened a new account in my name. I completed the necessary paperwork, but it would take a week for our joint accounts to be closed in my name. I paid off half of our joint credit cards that were overdue and closed the ones that had no balance. I didn't have to worry about retirement plans, health insurance, or cars because we each had our own. I requested that Carol's name be taken off of my retirement and life insurance beneficiary list via email to my HR manager. In retrospect, I was pleased with my performance that day. I spent the remainder of the week looking for a new place to live. Carol began sending me emails nonstop after I stopped answering her calls for a month. She still had the apartment key, so I didn't understand why she didn't just come over. At last, I responded to an email Carol had sent. Carol, please don't contact or see me ever again. Our union has ended. Have you ensured that? Please don't bother to leave me alone. I hope you had a good time spending time with Dan and Tim. Though I didn't anticipate a reply, she did. Steve, I apologize sincerely. This was not how it was supposed to work out. Dan, who I sent to assist you, told me you became agitated and left. Maybe the conversations from earlier had clouded my judgment. I'll give you a moment and get back to you. Carol wrote, I do care and miss you, as her final message. So now you know about my rough night, Pam. As I finished my second beer, I said, I am still furious with her, more than you can possibly know. I said, getting up and moving side to side. That's why you approached Dan then? And Tim, what about him? She inquired. About a month ago, I hired a private investigator to locate him. I'm aware of his current work and residence. I'm not sure now, but I did before I dealt with Dan. Trying to calm myself, I said, You do realize that he will be prepared for you? Stated Pam. Why put yourself through this? Dan won't be an issue for some time, as it appears he was the primary troublemaker. Now that everything is clear, Pam, let's put this chapter to rest once and for all. Carol at the end and Tim at the beginning. I informed her. I'm starting to worry about you, Steve. I hope you're not considering acting rashly. It might not go well for you after what transpired with Dan. Pam tried to talk sense into my head. No, not at all like that. However, I'll make sure she pays the price. Still furious and pacing, I said, she is going to be held responsible for her actions. Steve, just wait. You and Carol are no longer married. Why are you unable to let it go? You can no longer hurt her and she can no longer hurt you. Pam spoke softly. But Pam, I haven't divorced Carol yet. I threw away the papers that she had filed a few months ago when I received them. She is dating someone new, so she has been pressuring me to sign. Before this is over, I have one more move to make, I informed her. Steve, pay attention to yourself. You seem obsessed with exacting revenge. Go on after signing the paperwork. If you have one last chance to see her, will it really make a difference? She has moved on. How come you can't? Pam queried. For she must know how what she did to me and our marriage has affected both of us. With a raised voice, I spoke. I want her to keep it in mind. And she will with my scheme. I told Pam, Steve, this side of you isn't my favorite. You hold on tight. You'll do anything to harbor animosity. I believe I should go. This isn't who I thought you were, but I thought I knew you. I apologize for everything that transpired, but I find it impossible to let go of this. As she got up and put on her coat, Pam said, Steve, if you carry out your plans, then we're done. I'm giving you one last chance, so don't get in touch with me afterwards. Pam, goodbye. I answered her as she was leaving. I genuinely had feelings for her. I pondered in my mind. Tim opened his apartment door two weeks later, and I put my hand on his shoulder and led him inside. We must speak, I stated firmly. Hear me out, I did nothing improper. All of it was Dan's idea. Tim gave a brief explanation. He didn't listen to me when I told him it was too much. Carol made all the arrangements. After it occurred, we assumed everything was okay. I apologized profusely. It wasn't until we got in the car that I realized you were still struggling. Just leave me alone, please. Tim, I turn 19 in two weeks. By then, I need you to be out of here. Consider it a gift from you to me. There will be problems if you stay here after that. Are you following? I questioned him. He gave a nod. Do you recall the last two weeks? As I was leaving his apartment, I reminded him, down one to go one. With enough money, a lot of things are possible.
After spending nearly $8,000, my gift arrived in the form of an email the day before my birthday. It said that everything is scheduled for 9.30 a.m. On Wednesday, I felt better than I had in a long time when I arrived at work. There was cake for me in the afternoon, and everyone wished me a happy birthday. I had an early dinner with my boss, and I arrived home at about 8 o'clock. My answering machine started blinking and showing me 25 messages. I got rid of them all. I cracked open a Corona bottle and got ready for what was about to happen. There was a loud knock on my door just before 9 o'clock. I put down my beer, breathed deeply, and opened the door. You are quite brave, Carol yelled as Nick restrained her. Carol, good evening. What's up with you? I questioned in jest. How would you show my parents and friends that video? She inquired. Her eyes were filled with tears. What specific video are you referring to? Carol. Tell me what's in it and perhaps I can help. I answered coolly. Steve, why would you do this? Do you still feel so strongly about me that you would like to destroy my life? She asked. I understand what you're saying now, I said, attempting to sound casual. Carol has been branded as a more frequent cheater on her husband. I experienced it firsthand in addition to seeing it. When she eventually gave up resisting, I said, I revealed my scars to them by rolling up my sleeves. Are these visible to you? They serve as a continual reminder of your daily activities. They bring back memories of how you destroyed our union. I even believed for a while that Tim and Dan were doing you harm. Carol, I would have stopped at nothing to save you if I had known what was truly going on, since I was that concerned. I had no idea that you and them had planned the entire thing. Everyone blamed me for the breakup, including our friends and your parents. They denigrated me for more than a year. Perhaps now they will see the reality. I apologized. I repeatedly tried to speak with you, but you were never receptive, Carol said, crying now. Apologies. You apologize, right? I regret not bringing things to a close. I sent you that birthday card months ago, and that was the night we met Dan and Tim. This year on my birthday, I told you it would all come to an end, and it has now. This time, Steve, you've gone too far, Nick stated while glancing at Carol and Lisa. Have you seen the tape, Nick? I said that I hadn't. That's because I didn't send it to Lisa and you, he retorted. I did not wish to involve you in this. Watch the tape if you disagree with me, though. Imagine me attempting to assist her for hours on end. Then, if it had been Lisa, tell me what you would have done. Carol, I told him, I'll make sure a correction is sent out if there's anything on that tape that's not true. If not, that is how things are. I gave her a big envelope after that. These are the notarized and signed divorce documents. I have things to do before I go to bed, if that's okay. I wish I could say it's been pleasant, but it hasn't. When I finally leaned against the door after going inside and shutting it, I told her, I was aware that it was finished. I had arranged for her parents and all those who had supported her to receive copies of the tape. Following our split, I should have sent it to her church or place of employment, but I chose not to. I only put it on two websites instead. That should bring in enough money to pay for what I spent. Carol threatened to sue me, but she never followed through. The tape could not be linked to me because it was uploaded from a foreign website and traveled through multiple nations. After everything was said and done, my ex-in-laws sent me a brief email about three weeks later. I apologize. That was all it said. I had no idea. I never returned their calls, even though a few of my former friends made an effort to contact me and apologize. I suppose that I wasn't as horrible as people claimed to be. The video went viral very fast. It only required one person to download and distribute it. Carol was the talk of the town before long. Carol quit her job and relocated after about a month. Nobody at work brought up the video, even though a lot of people had seen it. I started to be perceived as someone who was impacted by the circumstances. Two months passed before Nick got in touch with me. Yes, he had watched the video, and I think his reaction would have been similar to mine. But we couldn't meet to maintain harmony in his family. Not yet, anyway. I got it. I lost Nick and Pam, too, if only momentarily. Pam was the one who never responded to my email. I mean, I tried. I resumed dating, initially with a few co-workers and later with other women. About four months after that trying night with Carol, I met here and there. Pam caught my eye at a downtown event. She first approached me while she was with some friends. Hi, and how are you, Steve? She inquired. Answering well, I did. I was informed about the incident and even watched a portion of the video online. Pam said I didn't know. 
She began to say something, but I cut her off. Yes, that is correct. You were unaware that at the time of your judgment of me, you perceived me as resentful and out to get even with my ex-wife. However, you made your decision. I suggested that we get together and chat at some point. Pam, do you recall my email from a few months ago, she suggested? Perhaps you were still agitated or making a point. I've experienced that. And did it really benefit me? I suppose it wasn't enough that I cared about you. I apologize, but it just won't work. I informed her as much. I'm going back on my date, if that's okay. I pointed to the short redhead who was making his way over to our table. I hope you find someone who brings you happiness, and I wish you well. When Tammy arrived, I said hello and added, Will you not be introducing me? Tammy inquired. Pam here, Tammy. I said, This is Tammy, Pam. I explained that we used to date a while back. Now that he's mine, Pam, I won't let him go. Good men are hard to come by. I've encountered my fair share of difficult ones, she grinned. Steve, sweetie, it was a pleasure to meet you, she said. Let's head back to your place. All right, Tammy, let's move. With a grab for my jacket, I replied. I walked up to Pam and hugged her, telling her very softly that I really liked her and that it took me a long time to move on. It's unfortunate that you didn't give me another opportunity. I gestured to her amiably and said, I'm going to miss you. We strolled through the throng and out of the club together after I grabbed Tammy's hand. Pam whispered softly as she watched us go. If only circumstances were different.